Okay. Um, where's but, that? But it does say 883,000. So wouldn't that kind of reflect the, the gain? No, that's what, what it is. It's the gain on oh, the, the value. Oh, it's taking in. Right. Yeah. Got it. Well, because you're, you're buying this property, or your investment in the property, your cash money investment is 128000 Yes. Okay? So, I mean, think about it like this. I mean, ignore all of these for a moment. If someone tells you, I can give you $128,000 today, and then five years later, you're going to pay me back $883,000, that's a big return. By anybody's standard. Very true. Very true. Okay. Now, <coughs> let's go back to the input sheet. Because you remember I said I thought that the acquisition price is probably a bit low. Let's double it. Let's make it a million dollars even. And thus is the beauty of a spreadsheet like this. We change one variable from five hundred thousand to a million dollars. Now, let's go to, so all we changed was that, and that obviously is going to flow through and have an impact on the cash we put up front, and it's also going to potentially impact the, the sales. So now our internal rate of return is lower to a 32% rate of return, from 81% to 30% based upon doubling that initial cost of the asset. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now if we go even higher with an acquisition price to let's say 1.5 million. Now we're losing money. Okay? We invested basically 344,000. We're really only getting back 149,000 if everything is said and done. Okay? And we've got a negative internal rate of return. Did you say 5 million? No, I said 1.5 million. Million and a half. Okay. Okay. Million and a half. Okay. okay. Any questions? I mean, so for IRR in general, the higher the better, right? Yeah, simple put. Because one reason I asked that is, remember, what was the insurance class? It was like, what was the insurance class? It was like, it's. Uh, that doesn't take into account necessarily the time to get the money back. Well, it, it does take into account the time. It just is a, is, a, is a question of some folks may want the money quicker. They may want to be able to uh, come up with, like, how many years before I get paid all, excuse me, all my money back, okay? There's different metrics as to how people want to analyze an investment. Internal rate of return and net present value are the, are the two most common for real estate investments, and it's kind of a lingo that most everybody is going to be speaking. And we'll talk about net present value. Um, you know, uh, we can talk about it tonight, and we can wait and talk about it also in the investments class. But it's just another measure of the financial performance of the asset. Okay. So now, the idea for giving you all of this is this is just another tool for you. You know, for other classes that you know you may be in now, or potentially some of the future classes, here is you know something to help you. Or for that matter, not even classes, just on your own, you have investments that you want to potentially value. You want to go out there and you want to look online. You want to find um, an apartment complex that's for sale or an office building that's for sale. You can put in all the information and get a good sense of what the value of that investment is going to be. Okay. It might just be, it's not an issue of maybe resending it, it may just be that you may have to open it up on a different machine. Who knows, but can you send it with the numbers? I was going to say something. <laughs> How about I just send you guys one? But I still need the numbers. It's working now, but I, I don't have it. Okay, yeah, yeah, if you oh, want to. Oh, yours is working now? I had to keep deleting it. Oh, okay. And then finally. But part, of it, part of it is also, at the very beginning, the whole macro thing that your it's computer. It's past that. The, it came the, over well, protected. Each, each computer, will, oh. and each version of Excel, right. may treat it ever so slightly okay. different. And so you may have to kind of eventually figure it out and it works fine. Right. 
I don't know how else to say that. Okay, questions? Um, MPV? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about MPV. All right, so. Simply put, you are going to, in many cases, have what is referred to as an investor as a hurdle rate. What is a hurdle? It's an obstacle that you must get over. Yes? Okay. So the idea behind the hurdle rate is it's kind of like it's a minimum required rate of return that you need to achieve as an investor or developer. Does that make sense? Now, what I mean by that is, like, where does that number come from? It is going to be unique now to each investor. Trolling, on many cases, I've heard him say that, like with the Brookwood Group, that many times they're going to say they're going to have a hurdle rate of maybe 15 or 20 percent on their equity. Well, that means that's the rate of return that they need to earn on the money that they are investing on that equity up here. Okay. Let me go back before. Let's go, let me go back to where I have the original numbers, where we're making money, exactly. Putting it back to 500000 Okay, and we come back here. All right. So what we can do here with this net present value, what, what it's searching for is a percentage hurdle rate, okay, that we would put in. And based upon that hurdle rate, it's going to tell us how much money we are making above that hurdle rate. So you're, you're, you're still probably just like, eh, not quite following. Okay, that's okay. So let's, let's put in the hurdle rate as being 81.54. Now before I hit enter, it should pop up as zero. Well, pretty close to zero, because we're rounding, $11, all right? Because what we're saying is, if my hurdle rate is 81.54, which is equal to this IRR here, that means that we've effectively broken even with what the project is actually generated. We have made our 81.54%, and really our net present value should be zero. The reason why it's not zero is, once again, strictly because of rounding. If we probably strung out the, the, the decimal place there, it would be zero. Okay? Now, what is going to happen is as I lower my hurdle rate to let's say 50%, then that means if my hurdle rate were 50%, meaning for every investment that I do as an investor, I want to get a 50% rate of return. Okay? Well, I'm obviously getting that with my my internal rate return here, but I want to know how much money I am earning above my hurdle rate. So what this is doing is this is saying I'm actually earning $113,000 above my required return of 50%. Okay? If I were to change the hurdle rate to 20%, more money. Okay? Now, we're, this is going to probably what's going to send you for you, because I can see that look a mile away. I'm giving it to you, man. You know, i got to get this. So, <laughs> so if, if I were to make this zero, net present value at zero, what should happen is it should, the big reveal, I haven't hit enter yet, it should make this number well, or it's going to be pretty darn, well, let's see here. Well, oops, it helps when I do this. Ah. Try point zero one maybe. Oh, yeah, well, 1%. Uh, well, that's, it's so counting that's in the also the cash flows and the property. But the, the point that I'm trying to make with this, <laughs> skipping down to the Excel. Okay. The point is simple. 
and that is that the, the NPV is simply an expression of my hurdle rate, is an expression of my required rate of return, and then this number that it's giving me is saying how much cash money am I earning above my hurdle rate? That's what it's telling me. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, the thing about this is that you're saying, well, why would you separate it out quite like that? Why would you sort of, because what may be the case is, is this, that I've got an investor scholar here who is telling me that as an investor, she wants a flat 10% rate of return on whatever money is being generated off of this project. And then anything above and beyond that 10%, then we have some other sort of side deal. That side deal could be we split this. Does that make sense? Or I get all of this. In other words, it's kind of like, I'm paying Scholar back, giving her her preferential rate of return of 10%, and then I, as the developer, get to pocket all the rest of the money. People or do that. I split it among whoever. So people do that. Absolutely, they do that. That's, that's, that is what's called deal structure. Okay? And deal structuring gets into then what we are sort of calling our waterfall. And the, the waterfall is basically set up whereby who gets paid, when they get paid, how much they get paid, and, and kind of in what order they get paid. Can we see that in your question? Yep. Okay. And so the, the idea behind that deal structure, that can be fundamental on you getting an arrangement with that cash provider. Many developers don't have their own money. Many developers go and raise money from a whole variety of folks that don't know anything about development. They just have a bunch of money. Which is what Craig did, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, there's, you know, one a classic example of this is a developer in Texas that we visited a number of times. His name was Marty Winder, was responsible for the development of really good portion of San Antonio, Texas. This guy, he has a partner, or did, this is several years ago, but down in South America, and the South American partner gave all the cash. Marty did all the deals, Marty put everything together, Marty got all the projects built, but the money partner, you know, just simply wanted whatever this fixed return was, and then Marty would get to potentially keep the remainder. Whatever that might be. Make Do sense? You call those people? They're developers too? No, they're not developers. They're just simply they're they they are simply equity partners. So they may not they may not get paid a fee or a very small fee to do the work, but then then they might they'll get the paid sort of on the back end. Yeah, see, okay, let's let's talk about this. Because I can tell you're finally interested. Okay. <laughs> so if you look at how developers get paid. They can be paid as a fee developer in the sense that I am a client coming to you, you are the developer, I pay you a set fee. More of almost kind of like what you'd pay a contractor. You know, but I'm paying you a set fee because of your skill sets. I don't want to have to deal with anything. You know how to get through the administrative and the legal hurdles and the construction process. And so I'm going to pay you a flat fee that's maybe a percentage of the overall project cost or just a flat dollar amount. Okay, that's one way to get paid. You don't want to get paid that way as a general rule. Okay? Unless you've got a client that's repeat business over and over and over again that and that fee is a pretty good fee. Another way of getting paid is you put in virtually no money whatsoever up front as the developer. And we didn't put any money up in that one either, okay, let's put that one up there. But another one is you would put up virtually no money up front. You would get your partner, your equity partner, whoever that is, to 
to put up all the cash for the deal. You do all the work. You deal with all the issues, all the problems. They don't want to be bothered. I mean, they literally don't want to be bothered. You know, they just want to check in the mail, okay, whenever the project is done. Now, how you get paid could very well be off of a percentage of the operating cash flow each year could also be off of a percentage of the sale price. Could be a combination of the two. But most of the time, the way it's going to be structured is your rich equity partner is going to be the one that's going to be paid first. Once they have been satisfied, then it sort of the, the, the remainder of the money trickles down to you. But it may not be just that simple. It may actually be that you've got multiple equity partners, multiple development partners, all of which you may want to split the money in a variety of different ways. Because you may have a development partner that does not, does not, does not, does not want any of this operating cash flow for tax purposes. They would prefer for tax reasons because, you remember, this is taxed at the highest tax rate. They may not want any of this money, but whenever it comes time to sell the property, they want a big chunk of that because that's going to be taxed as a capital gain, which is the lower tax rate. Does that make sense? So you begin to see, it's a, it's a fascinating sort of like jigsaw puzzle of, and, and no two deal structures are really alike. I mean, even it can be, but it, it's, it's really only limited by your creativity. I'm just sort of saying, I mean, imagine if we did a development deal, I'm the primary developer, and all of you guys are equity, a mixture of equity partners and co-developers and, and whatever else, I can have a very different deal with every single one of you. Do you follow? You may be paid first, you may be paid last, you may be paid just off of operating, <coughs> excuse me, just off of operating income, you may be paid on the upfront leases, you may, you know, I mean, this is like, it could be just, once again, use your imagination. All right? And so many developers, their typical sort of uh, payment is going to be they're going to you know, maybe receive some sort of you know, development fee kind of you know, up front to kind of get them through the, the actual construction process because they don't want to not make any money at all during the construction process and, uh, and so they will take a draw each month or you know, however often to kind of pay themselves a salary if you will and then whenever it comes time to, to actually lease up the property and to, to maintain it over the next several years, they'll take you know, a percentage of that, and then when it comes time to sell it, they'll take a percentage of this. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Other questions? Observations? Concerns? We're doing this actually in the artist class now, where we have, um, he's given us scenarios where we pay the, this developer first, up to 15%. So it's kind of all lining up. And that is where you're really going to see the detail is with an Argus developer because you can <clears throat> begin to make the most ridiculously complex deal structures mm -hmm. and, you know, begin, and it, 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 it can be, you know, predicated on a whole number of things that if our occupancy is above a certain level, you get a certain amount. If it drops just a little certain level, you get nothing. You know, I mean, it's just, it's fun. It's great stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right, other questions on this? All right, anything else? Okay. Um, okay, we already talked about the mentor thing. We'll get that resolved for, for you. Um, but I think you said everybody else is, is good with their mentor. Okay. And well, I guess we, we need to still deal with yours. Um, okay. And then also I sent an email today about the, that we're going to offer another construction class this summer online. Um, and uh, it'll be 100% online. You can take it, obviously. It'll be over the 14 weeks, so you can, you know, obviously deal with that. Then, uh, oh, yeah. And then the event, obviously, on April the 30th, the last day of class for the Saturday group. 
And I would definitely encourage you guys to, I mean, I know it's on Saturday, I know, you know, means you haven't come back up here, but it'd probably be a good idea for you to obviously mix and mingle with not only the, the, the students in the other half of the cohort, but, but obviously uh, um, some of the alumni that will be here and, and others. So uh, definitely kind of be thinking about that in terms of your calendar. All right, anything else? Good? You worn out? Did you learn anything? Okay, all right, go home. Thank you.